Hello, church. As promised, I am back to tell you about this week's story of Joseph. Up until now, Joseph's story has been about when life gets tough and we go through hard things. We all know it is very easy to react badly when those things happen to us, especially when we aren't the cause of those hard times. What we are learning from Joseph's life is that God always has a plan for those hard times, and we have the freedom to choose to respond with faith and prepare ourselves to be successful in God's economy. We have seen that Joseph wasn't to blame for his troubles in life. When we go through that, it is tempting to want to get even. When someone hurts you, we want to hurt them back. Getting even can happen immediately, or some people plot and wait a long time to get even. So dead brother, huh? And you said you, your sister and your dad. Both dead. But still got a mom, though? Killed by a dark elf. A best friend? Stabbed through the heart. You sure you're up to this? Absolutely. No rage and uh, vengeance, anger, loss, regret. They're all tremendous motivators. They really clear the mind, so I'm, I'm good to go. I'm only alive because fate wants me alive. Thanos is just the latest in a long line, and he'll be the latest to fill my vengeance. Fate wills it so. And what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, then what more could I lose? But when a person reacts like Jesus, we find ourselves willing to forgive and let God worry about who is right and who is wrong, and who has to pay. Anyone can react badly and take matters into their own hands, but a Christian with uncommon faith responds with grace instead of seeking revenge. Now, let's hear from Pastor Rick on the life of Joseph. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today, and we ask you to speak to us today because we need to hear from you in a subject that may be um, challenging for us. We know that your Holy Spirit will give us the courage and conviction to do what it is you want us to do. So we look forward to it. In Jesus' name, amen. So Joy and I, we were in High V yesterday, which is one of my least favorite places to be um, on a Saturday. It's one of my least favorite places to be any day because I don't like to grocery shop at all. But we were in Arkansas last week, hanging out with my granddaughter and my kids and having a great week, but we intentionally left the refrigerator empty and when we came back in town, we had to get some food. So I was talking to Pastor Dan on the phone. We were catching up a little bit about the week. And, and um, Pastor Dan, you know, right before we hung up, I said, hey, I'm in the parking lot of Hy-Vee and I need to, to go and get some food. And so Dan, uh, he just threw a little jab. He's like, hey, make sure you pick up some donuts while you're in there. Now he knows we try to stay away from donuts because it's not really what we're, something not on our diet. And Dan was just trying to give me a little jab there. And so I'm like, yeah, ha ha, donuts. And I was in Hy-Vee and um, well, I was kind of in the back of the store, following Joy around, trying to figure out how much it was gonna cost and how long it was gonna take. And, and sure enough, the weirdest thing happened. We were near the donut counter and they started calling to me. And I, I don't know if Dan was like doing some kind of weird mental, but and, and I looked at Joy and I said, you're not gonna believe this. I said, I want a donut. And she looked at me and she goes, don't. Now. That's the kind of partner you need, your spouse, right? Somebody that'll hold you up when you're trying to be on a diet and trying to follow your own rules. And I was like, man, that's a good woman right there. She's helping me out. And she said, don't get high V donuts. She said, if we're gonna do, get a donut, let's go get good donuts. And um, I looked at her and I said, get behind me, Satan. Joy, what is the, what's the deal? She's like, if you're gonna sin, sin boldly. Now, donuts aren't a sin and I did avoid the temptation, but I was thinking about that. If you're going to sin, sin boldly, well, that's crazy. But if you're going to live a life of faith, why don't we live a life of uncommon faith? If we're going to be in, let's be all in. If we're going to commit, let's be fully committed. Let's see what God can do with a group of people like us who have imperfect lives and desperately need his strength and power to be able to live, to find significance and to find meaning and hope. Now, speaking of sweets, we have a trunk or treat next week that I want to remind you about. We sponsor a trunk or treat for Cornell Elementary School, this, the uh, part of the Sadell School District, where we have cars that we decorate, we put in the parking lot, and they bring, uh, parents have cars and teachers and PTA members, 
And uh, the kids come over, and it's on Sunday afternoon next week, and uh, they come walk through the parking lot. We give them candy, hang out together. So if you have not yet signed up, I want to encourage you to sign up. You don't have to decorate your car, although we like it when you do. And come be part of that. There'll be a table in the lobby for you to sign up uh, so that we can support these kids next weekend. I encourage you to do that. Now, back to the message. Today, we're going to be talking about something that's going to require two things from you. It's going to require two perspectives from you that I'm going to assume we have, or at least we're trying to have. The first perspective is that you and I are going to have to agree with the reality or the fact that we are not the center of the story in life, that we are not the main characters and everyone else a supporting actor, that we are not the point. We don't stand still and let the world revolve around us that we live for something or perhaps someone greater than ourselves. The second thing is that I want you to embrace and to agree with, or at least to assume that's where we're heading today. And one of the foundations for what I'll be talking about is the fact that the point of life is to allow people who don't know Jesus and have the hope and the meaning that we have to see Jesus in our broken and imperfect lives. That's the point. And it's only by embracing these two points that you're going to be able to really grasp the hard truth of the message that I have for you today, because I'm going to be taking you to a diverging choice, a trail that will either lead you down the path of uncommon faith, or it will propel you down the path of bitterness, resentment, and a hard heart. And you're going to have to choose. Now, you didn't ask for that when you came to church today. You didn't know that was what was in store unless you have the app and already looked at the notes, which I guess I hope you did. But today we're going to be talking about giving up our desire for revenge. Now, it corresponds a lot to the idea of forgiveness. We talked about that the first week in our series, but it goes beyond just the concept of forgiveness. And it speaks to the list that you and I sometimes keep in our mind and our lives of people who we believe have wronged us and we're just waiting for the universe to bring them back around to where they're in the crosshairs of the scope, so to speak, or in front of the bumper of the car and that we can right the wrong, that we can get even, that we can get our revenge. These things are personal. They're private. Difficult. I asked my wife yesterday when we were driving, I was like, do women deal with this at all? I said, I don't know if women even struggle with this idea of revenge and vengeance and keeping score and holding grudges. And I've been married for 32 years, I think, and still don't really understand how women think entirely. And she said, oh my goodness, do we? She goes, women, we don't forget anything. And then I started thinking about it and I had forgotten that they don't forget anything because men, we forget a lot, right? She said, we deal with it. It's a big deal. And and we look back at the offenses and and sometimes the offenses are so great. And when I'm talking about forgiveness and talking about giving up the idea or the desire for revenge, I want to remind you that I'm not saying that the things that happened were okay. I'm not saying that they didn't really happen. I'm not saying that there needs to be a reconciling of the relationship, that what happened is legal and doesn't have consequence. I'm not suggesting that you weren't victimized. What I am suggesting is the Bible says that there's a way to live that demonstrates forgiveness. And it's allowing God to be God and for us to give the offense to him, even though it's real and painful, and tell him it's your responsibility, not mine any longer. And so today we're gonna be talking about the list that you may have in your mind of people who've genuinely wronged you, people who you perceived have wronged you, and people you'd like to see get what's coming to them. And without trying to spoil too much of what we're going to talk about, I want us to have the courage at the end of our time together to pray for people the same way we want someone to pray for us. To pray that God would bless others in the same way that we want to be blessed. But we have some ground to cover before we get there. So let's look together at this passage in Romans that we've started the series on every week so far. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us 
so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. The Old Testament was given to us so that we can learn from the stories of the people who had endurance in their faith and they encourage us in our faith as we try to live in an uncommon way. Now the Old Testament, as we've talked about, is 100% true, but it's not all 100% applicable to our lives. This story that we're talking about, the story of Joseph, is 100% applicable to our lives. And it's reinforced in the New Testament in places like this next passage here in Romans, this segment from the life of Joseph that we're going to discuss. And this passage is in Romans 12, and the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit tells us through the Apostle Paul, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I was thinking about a couple stories in the Old Testament that remind me of this desire for revenge and the choice not to. I was thinking about David. If you're a Bible person like me, you've grown up in church, you probably know David. He was a shepherd boy who became king, and he had a nemesis in his life, at least early on in his life, Saul who was a king, and Saul had some personality issues and he had some spiritual issues. As a matter of fact, Saul might have had uh, some diagnosable personality issues. He may have even had some things that needed medication uh, and maybe even imprisonment or confinement. Saul was messed up in a lot of ways. He didn't start that way, but he ended up that way and he wanted to kill David. He didn't like David's face. He didn't like David's personality. He didn't like David coming for his throne. He didn't like the people who liked David and he wanted him dead. And so Saul chased David all over the countryside, wanting to kill him and everybody David cared about. And David had reason to want Saul dead as well. The Bible talks about two stories. Both of them are found in 1 Samuel. The first one is that David and his men were hiding from Saul in a cave. And Saul went into the cave. Now, they didn't back in this day, they didn't have porta potties. They didn't have, you know, bathrooms at Casey's. Um, They had caves and places that you could go find privacy and relieve yourself. And Saul was going into a cave to relieve himself. Now, I don't want you to visualize too much because after all, it wouldn't be helpful for where we're heading today. But if the person is visualizing this or thinking about this, you would recognize that Saul was somewhat indisposed. When he was relieving himself in the cave, um, the mechanics involved in that would require at least uh, somewhat of, you're you're giving up an uh, advantageous position. Is that enough said, right? You're, You're susceptible to attack, fair enough. You're not on your guard. You're thinking about other things. We're all together, you better nod your head or I'm gonna keep going. Okay, (laughs) David is in the back of the cave and David's buddy was like, David, sweet Saul, he's here. Look what he's doing, we can get him. And David, he says, no, it's up to God to avenge, not me. Even though this guy has it coming, I'm not gonna be the guy to do it, no. I'm not gonna lay my hand on God's anointed. But he did sneak up behind to the side of Saul and cut a piece of his robe off. So Saul goes back out of the cave and David comes to the edge of the cave with his men and holds up the piece of the robe and is like, ha, could have got you, you know, could have got you when you were, you know, let him know. And Saul, he was repentant. Thank you for not killing me while I was indisposed. That would have been inconvenient and embarrassing. No man wants to die like that. I won't kill you now, David, you know, and they kind of made up. And then you see two chapters go by and Saul's after David again because he was off his rocker. The guy was unhinged. And David and his men came upon Saul sleeping at night, his sword or his spear jammed into the ground. All of his men passed out asleep. David's best friend, now's the time. Let's kill this dirt bag, let's get him gone, done, threat over. David said, "Uh uh-uh. We're not gonna kill him because it's up to God to avenge, but we are gonna mess with him. And so he snuck down into the camp and he grabbed his sword and grabbed another souvenir and the same thing happened and Saul still kept up his shenanigans. But the point was that David said, even though the offenses are real, even though what Saul has done is wrong, even though he deserves to pay, 
I'm not going to make him pay. I'm going to let God be God. I'm going to leave it up to him. Now, we're not talking about self-defense. The Bible says a person has every right to defend themselves from imminent personal threat and to defend your family. We're not talking about protecting your home. Proverbs says a fool lets somebody into their home without locking doors and protecting themselves. That's not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about with the desire to lay in wait for somebody, for karma to come back around and for us to be able to drop the hammer. And I don't believe in karma. For the universe to give us the opportunity to pay somebody back for what they deserve. We're going to see in Genesis 42 that Joseph had the ability, the time, the opportunity to kill his brothers. And if you've been following along on our series, you know his brothers had it coming. They had what? Beaten him up, thrown him into a pit, left him for dead, pulled him out of the pit, sold him into slavery where he was a servant, a slave, Accused of a rape he didn't even come close to trying to commit, in prison falsely, forgotten. But finally, the universe had come back around. Karma, giving Joseph the opportunity, is number two in command of all of Egypt. The person at the top of his list, the people who he probably had the hardest time forgiving, the epicenter of the worst times of Joseph's life were getting ready to come before him and beg, but they didn't recognize him. Listen with me. Genesis 42. The famine had ravaged the world for two years when Joseph's father Jacob learned that there was food in Egypt. When he heard this, he said to his sons, Why do you sit around here and look at one another? I've heard that there is food in Egypt. Go down there and buy some so we can survive and not starve to death. Ten of Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt to get food. Jacob didn't send Joseph's brother Benjamin with them. He was afraid something might happen to him. So Jacob's sons joined everyone else that was going to Egypt to buy food. Joseph hadn't just planned for the famine. He was actively running the country. He was the one who gave out rations to all the people. When Joseph's brothers arrived, they treated him with honor, bowing to him. Joseph recognized them immediately, but treated them as strangers and spoke roughly to them. He said, Where do you come from? From Canaan, they said. We've come to buy food. Joseph knew who they were, but they didn't know who he was. Joseph, remembering the dreams he had dreamed of them, said, You're spies. You've come to look for our weak spots. No, master, they said. We've only come to buy food. We're all sons of the same man. We're honest men. We'd never think of spying. He said, No, you're spies. You've come to look for our weak spots. They said, There were twelve of us brothers, sons of the same father in the country of Canaan. The youngest is with our father, and one is no more. But Joseph pressed on. It's just as I said, you're spies. This is how I'll test you. As Pharaoh lives, you're not going to leave this place until your younger brother comes. Send one of you to get your brother, while the rest of you stay here in jail. We'll see if you're telling the truth or not. As Pharaoh lives, I say you're spies. Then he threw them into jail for three days. On the third day, Joseph spoke to them. Do this, and you'll live. I'm a God-fearing man. If you're as honest as you say you are, one of your brothers will stay here in jail, while the rest of you take the food back to your hungry families. But you have to bring your youngest brother back to me, confirming the truth of your speech, and not one of you will die. They agreed. Then they started talking among themselves. Now we're paying for what we did to our brother. We saw how terrified he was when he was begging us for mercy. We wouldn't listen to him, and now we're the ones in trouble. Reuben broke in. Didn't I tell you don't hurt the boy? But no, you wouldn't listen, and now we're paying for his murder. Joseph had been using an interpreter, so they didn't know that Joseph was understanding every word. Joseph turned away from them and cried. When he was able to speak again, he took Simeon and had him tied up, making a prisoner of him while they all watched. Then Joseph ordered that their sacks be filled with grain, that their money would be put back in each sack, and that they be given rations for the road. This was all done for them, and they set off for Canaan. When they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get food for his donkey. There, at the mouth of his bag, was his money. He called out to his brothers, My money has been returned. It's right here in my bag. They were puzzled and frightened. What's God doing to us? When they got back to their father Jacob back in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened, saying, The man who runs the country spoke roughly to us and accused us of being spies. 
We told him, we're honest men and in no way spies. There were twelve of us brothers, sons of one father. One is gone and the youngest is with our father in Canaan. But the master of the country said, Leave one of your brothers with me. Take food for your starving families and go. Bring your youngest brother back to me, proving that you're honest men and not spies. And then I'll give your brother back to you, and you'll be free to come and go in this country. So I wonder where you are so far in your thought process and um, you're being interested in this subject and it may be getting your attention. I suspect some haven't really tuned in yet. Maybe some of you are a little skeptical sitting back and just sort of wondering if what I'm saying is possible or true. Maybe some have hardened a heart. Maybe some are right there on the verge of allowing the Holy Spirit to do something that will free you today. And I know that a lot of this has to do with personality, perhaps. For some, it may be easier than others. I know for me, this subject's really difficult. I am a person who never really, you know, like to walk away from a good fight. I enjoy the idea sometimes of, of revenge, of waiting, of seeing the opportunity and taking the opportunity of strategery, the sinful side of me, the Rick side of me. I could get this all wrong. So for me, this has been a difficult week because it reminds me to check my own heart and to make absolutely sure that I'm trying to walk with God in an uncommon way, even though it goes against personality and predisposition. And as we look at this story, I want you to check your own heart because if you don't, then today you're gonna waste an opportunity. I'm not asking you to compromise your moral values your femininity, your masculinity, your sense of right and wrong. What I'm asking you to do is to consider the fact that we are not the center of the world or even the point of our own lives, that we're not the lead actor and everyone else a supporting character, that the point of our life is to allow Jesus to be seen through the weakness in our life and to live in an uncommon way so that more people can see and find the hope and the meaning that you and I, that we found. By God's grace and our faith. So Joseph was in an opportunity. I mentioned to you the word karma twice. I'll say one more time, I don't believe in karma. But many people who like revenge believe in karma. And the first thing somebody says is they're going to get what they have coming to them. I hope it's soon. Karma's going to get them. The universe is going to bring it back around. If it's me that gets to drop the hammer, so be it. But fair is fair. And if I can be the person, then so much the better. I hope that's me. It's going to happen. And you wait and you watch. And Joseph had the opportunity. Number two in command of Egypt and the top people on his list came before him and they dropped to their knees and they worshiped him in a sense not like God but like he was the person who had the power to give them life food grain they didn't recognize him because Joseph's appearance had changed it had been about 20 years since they had beaten him up and thrown him in the well they thought he was dead Joseph would have had a clean shaven face all of the Jewish men looked much different for an Egyptian man, they were sort of manscaped. They were kind of pretty. They shaved their faces. They did their hair up. They dressed in really nice clothes. Jewish men looked a little Neanderthalic by comparison. They had beards that were out of control oftentimes, bushy hair. These guys would have had the shepherd's robes dirty and um, didn't recognize their brother. They believed that the beard connected them to God. The Old Testament teaching suggests that in the Jewish faith, a man that grew a beard was connecting to God in a way different than a man that didn't have one. If you have a beard or don't have a beard or you have something in between, that's okay. It has nothing to do with your connection to God now. That was a different day and a different time. But Joseph had the people who he probably wanted dead but also wanted to forgive in his life before him at the same time, and they didn't recognize him. He was speaking through an interpreter, even though he understood Hebrew. He told them, I'll give you the grain, but I'm going to put all of you in jail. You send one brother back 
Pick up your youngest brother and bring him back to me so that I know you're not spies, so that I know you're telling the truth. And then he took all of them and he threw them in prison for three days. That I can relate to, that I like. I like the poetry, the symmetry, the irony of taking your brothers who had you falsely imprisoned and have them imprisoned. Three days and Joseph waited. Many people wonder why Joseph waited. I think that Joseph was a lot like us and I think Joseph may not have been 100% sure what he was gonna do. I think he knew that God had a way And I think that he also knew that he had a way. And I think once again, we have seen Joseph come up to a diverging trail, a choice in his life. And should he choose wrongly, it not only would have affected his life, but ultimately our lives as well, as you follow Joseph and his line throughout history. So three days pass and Joseph pulls his brothers out of prison His heart is softened. He hears them talk about how God was paying them back for what they did to Joseph, even though they didn't know it was Joseph who they were before. Joseph sends them back home, except for one who he did imprison and hold as ransom with plenty of grain. And even the money that they had paid for the grain, well, he returned it to them. We see the story again in Genesis 42. And just like Jacob sent his boys to Egypt, well, they returned. But when they returned, they had no idea what fate was going to await them when they went to rescue the brother that was left by bringing back the brother that had remained. But we see that in Joseph's heart, that Joseph had continued to to soften And let's go to the next passage here. Let's keep going. And we see here at the very end that Joseph says, then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade freely in the land. But not only will I give you back your brother, but I'm going to give you everything you need. Not only am I going to restore your family, but I'm gonna give you safe harbor, food, protection. I'm gonna give you a blessing. Now this sets the stage for the next several chapters in Genesis where we see this play out and the drama is just unbelievable as Joseph has not yet revealed who he is to his brothers. Can you imagine him wanting so badly to reveal himself, but yet not doing it? Because God is doing something in these brothers just like he is in Joseph, just like he is in the continuity of history and ultimately the Christianity that we understand it. But the point is that this story of giving up, of offering the desire and the right for revenge to the Lord is not one that just is a story in the Old Testament that we read about and can dismiss, but reinforced in the New Testament. And I wanna take you as we kind of land this plane as we wrap this up to a passage in 1 Peter that's so personal and so hard. Get ready, buckle your seatbelts because you're gonna have to decide this is me or I'm not in. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's something you don't have to ask for God's help in. I'm not saying that it's something that's common. I'm telling you that for the last six weeks, we have developed and built characteristics of uncommon faith that come straight from the Bible that teach you to live in a different way, that reinforce the fact that we're not the center of the story, that people can see Jesus in us if we live this way. But it's hard. And I wanna challenge you that as we look at this, as we look at 1 Peter, this is the Holy Spirit telling you who you really are. Are you ready? Finally, all of you, how many of you is that? All of you, all of us guys. This is all, by the way, in your notes on the PDF if you have your app downloaded. All of this and more is in your notes. Finally, all of you. Now, it gives us some commands here. We're gonna break these down. Be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a greater blessing. Now, you may have glazed over when I read that because sometimes we do that when I read something and you're listening. But let me explain it to you. This is what the Bible is teaching. 
Number one, be like-minded. You and I, be like-minded. What does that mean? It means that we view our lives the same way. That you and I agree. We're not the center of the story. We're not the leading character in our lives. That we agree that we are called for a purpose, on purpose, to follow a man who introduced a message and set out on a mission that became a movement that changed our entire world. That the only way we find significance and true peace is by being willing to live for something besides ourselves. Now, that's a big ask. And this is just the way he starts. But this is uncommon faith. Number two, be sympathetic. It literally means to have the same feelings. Now, it's easy for us to mourn with people who mourn. When something bad happens to somebody or their kids or their job or their whatever, it's easy for us to say, oh, that's really too bad and you're sympathetic and you hurt. A little different when somebody succeeds, when something good or great happens to them, when God seems to be giving material blessing in life for us to be able to rejoice to the same level. But it literally is saying to us that if we want to get this right, we have to consider each other's successes and failures the same as our own. And that we hurt with those that are hurting just like it was ourselves. And we celebrate with those who celebrate just like it happened to us. It's hard. Uncommon. But possible through God's help. Number three to love one another. And I love this word because there are three types of words used for love in the New Testament. One is agape, one is eros. Agape is the kind of love Jesus had for us, the kind of love we're commanded to give to each other. Eros, the erotic kind of love, the love for stuff and people that sometimes can be misused or misplaced and lead us down the wrong path or our love between a husband and a wife in a romantic way, which would be the, the good application of that. This word phileo, or this, this word that's used here, is literally to have a genuine affection for each other, to genuinely like each other, to say, you know what, I love you, because I have to, but I like you because I choose to, and I want you to win, and I'm gonna do everything I can to help you win. That's a tough one for a lot of us. It's hard to like people. I can love you because Jesus made me love you. Jesus says love everybody. It's the love of commitment, the love of the will. It's the love because I have no other option. And that's, you know, maybe missing the spirit, but the letter of the law. But to genuinely say, you know what, I love you. And if you don't feel it, you keep saying it until you do. Well, there's more. You ready? You ready? I just want to make sure because I don't know. I mean, I'm just checking. I know they can't talk to me online. Do you guys ready online? Yeah, they'll tell me later. Be compassionate with each other. Oh, my goodness. Some of you are bad at compassion. Bad at compassion. Some of you are better at compassion than others. Some of you are naturally compassionate. If we are compassionate challenged or compassion challenged, it doesn't mean that we are able to live without compassion toward each other because these are characteristics that are given to us of what uncommon faith looks like. And it, these are the foundation, the, uh, well, it, it lays the way for us to be able to do something amazing that you're gonna see in just a second, to genuinely have the same emotion to have compassion for other people, to see the best, to want the best, to expect the best, and to be genuinely compassionate when that's not what we get. Because people will disappoint. But may I um, share a secret with you? It's easy for us to talk about all the people who've disappointed us, but you're a disappointment too. Disappointment is part of being human. Disappointing is part of us being sinful. 
and to be compassionate. It means that we choose to think the same way about our life, to choose to have the same feelings, to choose to love and genuinely like each other and to really literally say, I'm gonna believe and think the best and you and I are gonna become that together even though I fail you and you fail me because there's someone more important. All right, he sums it up, this part, with a reminder, and this, this word, humble, and by the way, don't make yourself the point. You're not the leading actor and everyone else a supporting character. The camera is not following you around in the documentary about your life. You don't stand still and the world revolve around you. Literally, don't make yourself the point. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or a vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. So we have these five. And these five are all appeals. They're more than suggestions. These are characteristics of uncommon faith. They're things that we pray for, things we aspire to, things the Christian community should thrive and be known for. Then he lowers the boom. Here, number six. And by the way, by the way, do not repay. And it's interesting because there's a compound thought here. And I think it's interesting also because the assumption is that offenses happen. People are offensive. I'm offensive. You're offensive. Your wife is offensive. You are offensive to your wife or husbands to wives or parents to kids and kids to parents and coworkers. We are prickly. When offenses happen, willful, accidental, imagined, that should cover it all. Don't repay. In 1 Peter, we see very specific construction. Two different types of offenses. When somebody does something to you, don't do it back. When somebody says something about you, don't say it back. Oh, wait a second. Oh, preacher, you've gone too far. I was tracking with you kind of until you just started talking about that, and now I've got to go. It's time for lunch. This is tough, right? When people are saying things about you, when someone has done something to you, the Bible is really clear. When they do, don't do. When they say, don't say. What if they're trying to destroy my reputation? What have we said so many times? We worry about our character. God worries about our reputation. Character is who we are. Reputation is who other people think we are. We control our character. God worries about reputation. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard that it's uncommon. But it gets harder and uncommoner as we continue. Don't repay evil with evil when somebody says or does something to you, but repay them. What do I get to repay them with? What do I get to, can I, can I pray a prayer of Old Testament smiting and smoting where they get boils in uncomfortable places and their, their livestock die and their house falls down and lightning strikes and, I mean, no. We don't even get to pray against them. We repay evil, intentional, unintentional, or imagined, which covers it all, with a blessing. The people on my list, God, restore a right relationship between you and them, because it seems to me like it's damaged. And here's the hook. Do it as gently as possible. A person who reacts to evil 
done to them or said about them simply retaliates and evens the score. John Wick, Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, Thanos, great movie plots, great literature. A person who reacts to evil done to them or said about them simply retaliates and evens the score. But a Christian who chooses to respond with uncommon faith refuses to even the score or avenge wrongs done to them. In fact, they pray a blessing for those who are in the wrong. So, this is a reminder. When they do, don't do. When they say, don't say. So what in the world do we do? Now, I'm going to share with you a prayer. And this prayer is basic. It reveals to you how basic I am. In my faith... Just like in your faith, some things are harder than others. This one's a hard one. And it's a basic prayer. So basic that some of you who are more spiritually mature and perhaps don't deal with these sorts of things the way most of us do, you won't relate. But for the other 98% of us, I hope it sort of hits you where you're living. I hope you connect with it. It's a prayer from my heart that I've learned from the life of Joseph that's been reinforced so many times throughout the New Testament. And I want to share it with you. It's in your notes on your PDF, on your app. I encourage you to pray this version or your own, and you can even insert names should you choose. God, what they did hurt, and I'm mad. God can handle these kinds of prayers, friends. I'm really mad, really, 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 really mad. God, I'm mad, do you hear me? I'm mad. We don't surprise God. He doesn't look at us and cross us off his list. He doesn't say, I thought you were that kind of person, Rick, and now I don't wanna have anything to do with you. He knows you're mad, so tell him, own up to it, be honest. I'm mad. They deserve to pay, and I wanna hurt them. Sometimes, here we go, people. It sounded too distant. Here we go, friends. Sometimes I even want you to hurt them for me, God. I know people who pray for God's vengeance on other people who they think have wronged them. These aren't imagined people. These are real people. I know people who pray these prayers. And I've never seen a person who prays these prayers with a soft heart and a humble spirit, not one time. And I'm not being judgmental, I'm just observing. Sometimes I even want you to hurt them for me, God, but I know there's a better way. I'm not sure if I can do it, but I'll try. Help me. I want to live a life of uncommon faith. We exhale. I will forgive. I will not hold a grudge. And I give you my desire for payback. Give those who hurt me the same grace I want you to give me. Isn't it interesting how we judge other people? in a way that's much different than the way we want to be judged or perceived. We want everyone else to get what they deserve, but we want to receive not what we deserve, but grace and mercy from other people and for the Lord. And there's something messed up in us that just makes us feel like we deserve it, but they deserve something different. So to have the courage to say, God, give those who hurt me the same grace that I want and expect for you to give me. There I said it. Now help me to mean it and live it. Because I'm not the center. I'm not the star of the show. The world doesn't revolve around me and it doesn't revolve around you. God put me 
He put you, he put us here on purpose and for a purpose. And as we choose to live this life of uncommon faith, the world around us is going to see something different. And I think it's what we're all looking for. Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray that 